Hi, welcome to the Wikipedia Weekly Network's Authors Roundtable that we're having for the Wikipedia at 20 book. We'll get started in a minute or so, but if you are watching us on YouTube or Facebook, feel free to like or subscribe or to let other folks know about this roundtable with some of the experts on the history of Wikipedia and the future of Wikipedia. So in the meantime, you can type in the comments section, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, and we can see your feedback and we can bring up selective comments. If you are using Facebook, you can go to streamyard.com slash Facebook to actually authentic authenticate and let StreamYard show your name and face on the screen when we have your comments. So we'll get started in a few minutes or a minute or so, and we'll start bringing in your comments on the screen. Hi, folks. Welcome to the Wikipedia Weekly Network's Roundtable with the authors of the Wikipedia at 20 book. My name is Andrew Lee, also known as user Fuzzhedo on Wikipedia. And I want to welcome you to our 20th birthday of Wikipedia on Wikipedia Day, January 15th, 2001 is when it was started. So it's been a big celebration day so far, and we wanted to uh, have a, a nice roundtable of folks uh, talking about the, the past and future of Wikipedia. Um, I'm currently the Wikimedian at large for the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. And uh, it's just amazing to see how far it has come. So let's, without further ado, introduce some of the panelists that we have today. So first I wanna introduce Phoebe Ayers. Hi, Phoebe. Hi, Andrew. Um, so happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about who you are and where you are. Sure. So I'm uh, currently in Boston, Massachusetts in the U.S. and uh, I'm a librarian. I have been editing Wikipedia for 17 years now, um, which is kind of mo mind blowing for me. Um, I've also done lots of other work in the projects. I am a former member of the Wikimedia Board of Trustees and the co-author of a book called How Wikipedia Works. Great, thank you so much. And uh, we are bringing in next the two co-editors of the book. First, I want to introduce Joseph Regal. Hi, Joseph. Oh, you're muted, so we need to unmute you. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Phoebe. Sorry about that. Great. Tell us where you are and and who you are. I'm in Cambridge, probably not that far from Phoebe, and uh, I work at Northeastern University where I teach about popular culture and online communities. <clears throat> and I, I just checked, I, my Wikipedia account was created in 2004, though I edited a little bit before that. And I wrote a book back in 2010, after your own Andrew, called Wikipedia, uh, uh, um, talking about good faith collaboration. And so after all of these years, I thought it would be useful to maybe pull together a lot of the people that had insights and, and experience with Wikipedia and reflect on how we, we've gotten where we are. Great, thank you so much. And I want to introduce uh, also an editor on the book, Jackie Corner. Hi, Jackie. Hi, how are you? Tell us where you are and what you're up to. Well, I am actually right in the middle of the United States in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, most recently, I've been uh, getting in trouble doing lots of things uh, policy related, uh, talking about governance work and uh, universal code of conduct. So all sorts of fun stuff on the backside of Wikipedia. That's great. Thank you so much. And I want to introduce Brian Keegan, one of the contributors to the book. Hi, Brian. Where are you and what are you up to? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm uh, in beautiful Boulder, Colorado, uh, and I study how Wikipedia covers breaking news, and so there's always fun things to study with that. And I'm an uh, assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder here. Excellent. And uh, we also have Denny. Denny, how are you? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm Denny Vranicic. I'm joining from Berkeley, California, um, and um, 
I'm the creator of Wikidata and now joined the Wikimedia Foundation half a year ago to work on AppSec Wikipedia. Very good. And we'll be hearing later on about abstract Wikipedia and kind of the future of that project. Uh, hi, Mako. Tell us where you are and where you're from. Where am I? Uh, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm Benjamin Mako Hill. I, I'm here in my basement in Seattle, Washington. And uh, I am another one of those, another one of these academics on the panel. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Washington and I study Wikipedia and I study a lot of, um, and I think that my angle is often by doing kind of comparative studies. So I actually look at lots of attempts to create, you know, projects like Wikipedia, different kinds of wikis. And I try to understand the, you know, dynamics of the kinds of decisions that people in Wikipedia make. Excellent. Thank you. And we also have Sean. Hi, Sean. Tell us where you are. Hi, um, I'm here in my attic <laughs> in Baltimore, Maryland, um, and I am a art librarian at Maryland Institute College of Art, um, and I'm one of the co-founders of Art and Feminism, which is an international community to improve coverage of feminism in the arts on Wikipedia. Excellent, thank you. And we also have Stephen Harrison. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Andrew. Um, I'm based here in Dallas, Texas, and I. Uh, I'm an attorney and a journalist who kind of stumbled into this Wikipedia journalism beat back in 2016. Um, I have a column in Slate now called Source Notes that really focuses on Wikipedia. And um, I was telling another journalist this morning, I think that the Wikipedia beat is just one of the most interesting in the world. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Great. Uh, and, you know, he, he just came out with a piece in Columbia Journalism Review about covering Wikipedia uh, by the media, which is really nice to, to have. Phoebe, go ahead. Um, well, one thing that we might want to tell people is that um, as we talk about the book, the book text is actually available at this address, wikipedia20.pubpub.org. Um, that's a site uh, put together by the MIT Press and a, a project called PubPub. And we, so you can go and check out the book and our chapters um, as we talk or after after we talk. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I thought maybe I'd turn it to uh, Joseph and Jackie, since you're the editors of the book. Uh, tell us a little bit about how the book has, uh, has come out so far and what the impact has been of the book. Uh, how has it been received? What were some of the things that you found um, when the book has now come out uh, are different than when you were planning it? Or how is it, how is it compared to when you were planning stages? Maybe Joseph, yeah. Oh wait, unmute you, Joseph. Sorry, I was thinking about this about three or four years ago. And again, as I said at the intro, Wikipedia has come so far. And in some ways, Wikipedia is exceptional in that there have been lots of sites and web services around for 10, 20 years now. We're all getting a bit old. And what I found most interesting is in some ways, Wikipedia was very much the same phenomenon. Almost every other website has become basically a surveillance capitalist advertising sort of company. And Wikipedia has not. It's tried to stay true to its original vision. But in other ways, it's changed quite a lot. And so Stephen talks a bit about this in his piece with Omer in the book. Uh, but how Wikipedia went from being the dietary equivalent of a Big Mac, which is what the uh, former head of the ALA once compared it to, to being the good guy, to use a term from another journalist, Noam Cohen, of the web. And that was a really interesting inversion. So I started thinking it'd be really nice to collect different perspectives, trying to basically uh, get insight from hindsight, because it's not often you have the opportunity in the tech world to look back 20 years, because uh, everyone always look, is looking ahead or looking at the kind of crises of the immediate present. And so that's what I intended to do with the book. And it was a challenging process throughout. Uh, but I'm really glad that we, we were able to include everything that we did and put it up there and make it available under a Creative Commons license. A number of folks to, to thank for that, but especially uh, the folks at MIT Press that helped to make that possible. Yeah, how about you, Jackie? What do you think about this, the climate we're in? I think this is this is such an important book for right now because it, it shows a collection of everyone's thoughts and uh, conceptions about Wikipedia from when it first started, and especially as Wikipedia is becoming uh, even more a uh, household name in these current times of misinformation and people just looking for some information they can trust. Um, we're dealing with lots of uh, individuals who 
are tricked, uh, frankly tricked by this information. And Wikipedia is offering that stable resource um, where people connect, can connect with information and the information is updated as well. So if something is, um, you know, emerging as a topic, um, there again, this is something that's a beautiful aspect is that there's, there are people around the clock helping to create this quality information and ensure that information is disseminated to people who really need that information. And I'm finding that people are reaching out uh, to me about this book who are really getting involved with Wikipedia. They had no idea, you know, even still we're thinking 20 years, you know, people have to know that there's a lot of us behind this, um, but people don't. And it's still a surprise. And I, I still had so many conversations even just last week with someone uh, and she said, I had no idea before I started covering uh, this birthday that uh, there was so much happening. I just thought it was curated by some AI somewhere. I'm like, no, I mean, kind of, but you know, in some <laughs> aspects, but not, not all aspects. Um, so right. this, is, um, this is something that feels really special is that people are getting more involved. And it feels like a fresh opportunity for people to know the history and know the community and know the connections behind this, um, especially when people are finally turning to Wikipedia to understand more about it as it's really impacting their lives on the daily. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's funny, Josie, you mentioned the ALA piece um, because I think that was maybe five, 10 years ago that that ALA comment was out or something older. Oh, no, it was a long time ago. Yeah, but the funny thing is, is since then, ALA has actually published a book on how to leverage Wikipedia for librarians, so that's quite a quite a change in, uh, in approach to that. Yeah, that was one of the inversions I thought was really interesting, pulling this book together, the work that Jackie and I did. Another was a comment I always quote from one of the contributors, uh, Alex Alexandria uh, Lockett, was that many of us, at least the academics or people involved with teaching, we got interested in Wikipedia when we were coming up as students or grad students. And it was, you know, why are you doing that? Why are you wasting your time with that silly website? And now those of us that are still in the classroom, Wikipedia is a really powerful learning resource. Uh, and so one of these neat flips is we went away from saying, oh, never, never use Wikipedia to using Wikipedia to understand how act actually information is constructed. Because, you know, the question of facts and what is a fact and what is knowledge and what is truth and what is fake uh, is really important one, obviously. And the neat thing about Wikipedia is you get to see the sausage being made to allude to that sort of famous uh, quote. And it's not always easy. It's not always pretty. It's not always uh, fun, <laughs> but sometimes it is. And I've made some good friends and acquaintances through the process and letting students understand that it's not easy that people are arguing back and forth about, is this a reputable source and whatnot? That's a really important lesson for people to learn. Going back to Jackie's point of, even after 20 years, people still don't really understand what's going on with Wikipedia. Right, right. And uh, Brian, Steve, Stephen, you're a journalist working on stories all the time. Brian, you, you analyze it in the kind of journalism context. Already, Wikipedia's reputation was trending up over the years, right? It was. Um, already seeing like, oh, this is actually one of the gems of the internet. I think especially in January of this year, it's even gotten a bigger boost with deplatforming and everything else in the mix. And it's astonishing to see all the news stories coming out today where almost every single one is glowing about Wikipedia. Maybe you could reflect on that, uh, Stephen and Brian. Like, like, Are you seeing the same type of thing or is it, it, is it quite different in terms of how the coverage is right now? Oh, uh, so when I reflect on this, go ahead, Stephen. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I'll follow you. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when I was reflecting on this, I was thinking a lot about like, so I started editing Wikipedia in 2006 as an undergraduate student. And I was always remarking on the fact that like, I never seemed to be able to be the person when a story broke to like be able to create the first edit or the first article uh, about those kinds of events that Wikipedia has this remarkable ability. Wikipedians, these editors have this remarkable ability to just be respond so quickly to things that are happening in the world. So they're always there updating these articles within minutes or hours of these major events happening, whether that's the 9-11 attacks or the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquakes uh, or elections or the Arab Spring or the Japanese earthquake and nuclear disasters. And like, and so when we think of something like in 2011, we like just pause and take a moment, uh, just even like 10 years ago where we had the Arab Spring happening, we had the Japanese earthquake, tsunami, nuclear disasters happening, we had Occupy Wall Street happening. 
And so we had all these super complex events happening that required updating all like dozens, hundreds, thousands of articles. And, and, and despite all these things happening in parallel, despite the fact that Wikipedia's uh, editors only comprise like a tiny fraction of the people who actually use and read it, uh, in spite of all those challenges, I'm always ref reflect on the fact that Wikipedia over its whole entire 20 year history has always demonstrated this capacity to respond really quickly to things that are happening in the news. Uh, and, and I think that coupling of information production and consumption is something that's really contributed to its growth and success over the years. Yeah, good point. Steven, you want to say? Oh, I, I, I agree. And, and I've actually I've referred Brian's chapter of the book that really focusing on 9-11 as a case study and, and that beginning uh, use of Wikipedia for um, breaking news. Uh, within the book that, uh, or the chapter that I wrote, we talked, I, I noticed that there were kind of like four different phases of Wikipedia coverage. We had this sort of anarchy phase and all of the coverage was really focusing on how the site has no rules. Then it kind of moved into the wikiality phase. You think of Stephen Colbert and truthiness, and he actually edited Wikipedia live on air a number of times, um, for better or worse. Uh, there's lots of stories about Wikipedia's bias, uh, maybe peaking around 2017 bias in terms of gender, uh, race, et cetera. Um, and those stories have continued, frankly, but then more recently, and I do agree with what you said, Andrew, I think in January, the press coverage has been has been really glowing and it's been really positive in the sense of, you know, how can how is Wikipedia helping us with some of the biggest issues that we're facing now in terms of uh, disinformation? Yeah, I mean, it's jarring to the point where we're not used to it. We're like, I'm not used <laughs> what do to we do? Yeah, yeah. That there's nothing wrong with Wikipedia. So it's kind of <laughs> interesting about that. Um, Maybe we could turn a little bit to the, you know, the impact of Wikipedia beyond just being a site we'd stumble across on Google. And I know that both Mako and Denny have written about the the impacts in research, in science, and in, in in other folks using the corpus of Wikipedia for things. So maybe Mako, you could talk a little bit about what you wrote about in research implications of Wikipedia. Yeah. So I mean, I really sort of saw myself resonating with what jo jo Joseph's point about the sort of inversion about where we sort of like we, we're now understanding how knowledge is made by looking at Wikipedia mm -hmm. um, and I think he was mentioning in the classroom and I actually saw another comment from someone else who sounds like they also sort of teach with Wikipedia and I think it's really important um, uh, I, I you know I came up through grad school editing Wikipedia um, and encountering a ton of skepticism and now I'm you know, I'm teach now. I'm at the front of the classroom, and I'm teaching students to edit Wikipedia and contribute with Wikipedia um, with a lot of really great help and resources from the Wiki Education Foundation. But I think it's not just true about how we teach about knowledge construction more generally or how we learn about that. I think that Wikipedia has also, in this really kind of surprising, to me at least, way, really taught us about how we build knowledge and about a whole bunch of other things in general. Um, so much of our understanding of the world has come from Wikipedia. So my chapter is, uh, the chapter in the book is called uh, uh, The Most Important Laboratory for Social Scientific and Computing Research in History, um, which I think uh, is is n not meant as uh, you know an, 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 to to be sort of an, an exaggeration. I think that that it's absolutely true that that I mean, 20 years ago we couldn't have imagined that we were you know going out to create you know this incredible sort of thriving taste that would teach us about organization that would serve as a data set for like almost all kinds of stuff. Um, I got into this. Um, I went to present. I, I tried. I signed up one year to present about the last year's research um, to the Wikipedia community. So I was going to go to the, you know, to Wikimania and sort of talk about what it is that been published in the last year. And there had been 800 papers published in the year previous. And it wasn't a, like, it wasn't a particularly bad year. That's just the, that's, that's what's coming out of the machine. Um, there are thousands and thousands of publications which um, have been published about Wikipedia. Part of that is because the data is open. Part of it's because it's this um, uh, because the community is is so sort of open and transparent um, and generous with sharing its uh, with data. And some of it's just because it's this incredible example um, uh, of of uh, of organization uh, at a scale and of a type that has been hard to study before. And so I think that that. Um, that uh, you know, my chapter documents a whole bunch of specific areas that we've learned a lot about. Um, we can learn a lot about the world by uh, you know sort of seeing what people are viewing in Wikipedia. We can learn a lot about how people sort of navigate conflicts by looking at the way in which that sort of um, um, plays out. Uh, and then we can and we can use Wikipedia as a data source for a range of important sort of uh, um, challenges in computing, around uh, natural language processing, around um, information retrieval. Um, it's been this 
uh, um, I think that it's it's kind of a, a side effect um, uh, in some sense, but it's like like an unbelievably valuable side effect. And I think that, that there are now, uh, there, are, there are academic conferences and journals focused on Wikipedia. Um, uh, it's just like, uh, it's really like standing back and looking at it. I think that it's, it's maybe not the thing that people within the community sort of see as often, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a really impressive um, achievement that the community has made. Yeah, I mean, you look back on it, it's like, how do you do entire swaths of research without the corpus of Wikipedia as, to draw on, right, in terms of like political speech and pop culture, things like that. You're absolutely right. And now, Danny, you've been working in this field too. I mean, so you worked with Google for many years. Now you're working on a new project with the foundation. But can you talk about a little bit about from your field as also the father of Wikidata to think about the implications of Wikipedia and how you're extending that? I think it's really hard to overstate the role that Wikipedia has played in um, modern AI and in, in, in uh, in a lot of those fields. Um, since 2005, 2017, so, so quite early on, um, AI has recognized Wikipedia is providing this huge catalog of entities which are, which are tremendously interesting. And this is, has been something that uh, Wikidata has picked up that is, it is building upon on it. And today, um, more and more institutions, if you think about, you know, national libraries, if you think, of, think about big museums, uh, Andrew, you would know about these things, um, uh, about galleries and so on, they are all connecting to Wikidata, to Wikipedia, as the big repository of entities. And um, in this way, Wikipedia, Wikidata, um, is coming from the point of reflecting the world and becoming to the place there where we start organizing and influencing and changing the world in very deep matters. And um, it's no surprise then that you, for AI research, uh, Wikipedia has been such a huge, important corpus. And for things like machine learning, like for, for neural translation, um, for, for many other fields, um, Wikipedia is just absolutely necessary. And this is not and the main reason for that is uh, on the one side that we have Wikipedia articles which are nicely structured, which are kind of talking about all the things we, uh, in the world which are important, which fulfill our notability criteria. But also, and this is really a failure of the, I don't know how to say that, of the rest of the world, that we couldn't use other works for this thing. We couldn't just take, you know, textbooks and analyze them. We couldn't take encyc the Encyclopedia Britannica and do the same thing, which is a shame. There's so much the centuries, of, the last century, the, basically 20th century is locked away from research. Um, and, and this is a shame. And Wikipedia shows us what we could achieve, but uh, projects like Google Books and similar projects which, where we could look into the content, into this, this huge corpus of knowledge are not really are uh, just being thrown with, uh, with legal and economic um, barriers, um, which is truly a shame. And Wikipedia, I think the, one of the tremendous um, successes of Wikipedia is that we use an open license and that we are allowing this kind of uh, progress, that we are allowing this kind of research on top of our work and um, that we're showing the huge benefits we could have. Right. And I think you used a great word like unlock, right? Without the free part of Wikipedia, it's locked up in copyright. And even though you can read it, you can't really use it. And that's the beauty of Wikipedia, right? So maybe a, a nice bridge is also, uh, Sean, I'll get to you in a second about talking about the implications for glam and culture, right? Um, so Danny is working on a project called Abstract Wikipedia. And what's the best way to describe it? It's instead of having a, a fact like, Marie Curie is the only person who ever won the Nobel Prize in two different fields, and then waiting for someone to translate that sentence 300 times to 300 different languages, what if you could represent that fact in some programmatic way and then generate the texts in all these other languages, right? That's kind of what Abstract Wikipedia is trying to do. Yes. Um, the goal is basically to... Sep so currently we support more than 300 languages, and we have uh, millions of articles of content. And right now you have to represent each article in each language, which is such a huge amount of work, right? So we need to write, basically, we have about 20 million topics that we have articles about. So if you would have them in 300 languages, this would be 6 billion articles. And we had 55 million articles, 58 million articles. So we're like 
at 1% of where we could be right now. Um, if we manage to separate the language and the content into two independent ways that we can maintain and curate independently, we can actually create the content um, much more effectively across the languages and supplement the places where current Wikipedia have gaps. So the idea is to, to, to find a way, to find a notation that can capture the content of the Wikipedia article in a way that can be with high fidelity translated into the individual languages so that we can have the, uh, those uh, these contents be reflected in all of those languages. Um, and if something is being updated, it's updated immediately in all of the languages. And if someone contributes from any language, it would be immediately available in the other languages for those places where the local Wikipedias don't have better funds for themselves. Right. Very ambitious, but very, very exciting in that this is perhaps truly a way to kind of write once, but read in many places at the same time. Right. And I guess related to what, um, what Mako and Denny were talking about, we also do have to worry about what a lot of people are talking about with, um, you know, algorithms is do we, are we doing our best to try to uh, correct for some of the biases that we have in Wikipedia, right? If we just take the power of abstract Wikipedia, just reflect the biases everywhere, that's also a bad thing, right? So we need to guard against those, those things. So Sean, one of the things that you've been working on with uh, art and feminism, and also what we've been trying to do with the community with women in red, is to try to do a better job with the, the gender balance. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your work and what you wrote about in the book. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I feel like my my contribution here is you know I'm 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 a, probably the newest editor. Um, my first I created my account in 2014 at our first art and feminism event, um, which I did co-organize with a number of people who were sort of longtime Wikipedians who'd been teaching with Wikipedia for a long time. Um, and, you know, like many people uh, had a similar experience. One of my very good friends is a professor of Italian and she came and basically brought her entire master's thesis as she was going into her dissertation and was like, all right, I'm turning this into an article and more people have seen that article than have seen her, you know, master's thesis on a 16th century female Italian poet. <laughs> um, and it was this sort of lovely moment for me of realizing um, you know, the power of editing, but for me as an educator and organizer, that's kind of where I have come in. Um, and art and feminism, you know, is about correcting historical records, but it's also about building community and building community in a way that's equitable and inviting women and people of color, um, you know, into a project that can be a sort of difficult space to enter into if you're not already comfortable with the rhetoric of Wikipedia, with the ways that people interact, especially prior to, um, I think I didn't say this when we were talking in advance, but one of the biggest things for us was the visual editor, um, because prior to that, it was much harder to get people to come and learn how to edit. And we'd spend so much time at edit-a-thons with, with people who like had a lot of knowledge, but just were so uncomfortable with the structure of it. Um, that, you know, being able to bring people in and talk to them about, uh, honestly, about neutrality and biases and, you know, all of these things that go into, you know, this, this project and how we really approach it from a feminist perspective. Um, so the, yeah, that was a huge kind of shift for us was that movement of getting people in getting them comfortable in the space and feeling like we're, we're just sort of trying to shepherd them through. And it's, I've always said that the work of organizing Wikipedia for me has been an extension of my work as a librarian. Um, I'm a teaching librarian. So most of what I do all day, every day is teach students. And I use Wikipedia articles constantly. Um, I love showing the bell hooks article and showing the long talk page discussion about capitalization of bell hooks name and talking about like norms and community norms. Um, I love also comparing like Grove art online or Oxford art online, which is, you know, the sort of encyclopedia that most people use to teach art history um, and comparing the Anna Mendieta article, for example, um, on Wikipedia, which is actually more robust and has a ton of links to it and is an, an article that was created in art and feminism events. So, you know, for us, it's really been a community organizing uh, project working both kind of within and, and outside this sort of traditional, we think of the traditional community of Wikipedia um, active editors. Right, that's, that's great to see. And Joseph and Jackie, maybe to loop back to you, what do you have any reflections on, you know, in your experience with Wikipedia so far, how, how is the uh, addressing the gender gap? Uh, where are we right now? Jackie, you've written about this quite a bit in terms of what 
we can do or how is our status right now? Is the trajectory in the right direction? What's our performance right now? Uh, yes and no. It's, it's <laughs> the editor base is still about 87% uh, white male, uh, largely. So it's it's coming along but i think there are some things that are in the works right now that will definitely help impact that quite a bit uh we have some of the movement strategy work that is coming to um be more inclusive and intentional uh, with different things and, and we a lot of the research that's out there talks about and this is something that's a bit of a bone to pick with me that oh well, of course women aren't on there because it's technology and women don't have as much technology experience and i'm like wait a minute that's I don't buy that completely um, because there's social aspects as to why uh, women are participating. There could be um, situations of harassment um, that women are just like, okay, I deal with this enough all day. I don't need to deal with this here too. I'm going somewhere else. Um, or just it's a traumatic event and they don't want to come back. Um, and then it also comes to time. You know, there's been a lot discussed about emotional labor and women's experiences right now. Uh, in the last several years, and it comes to light at about, oh, maybe that's why that women just don't have that extra brain space or that extra time because um, although multitasking has been said not to work, um, ask any woman and I can guarantee at any given time, there's some backside buses running about what else has to happen throughout the day while they're also doing several different things. So editing Wikipedia might just not be the um, on the forefront, but also, are we really intentionally engaging with women? Sure, we might have these movements and say, okay, women, you're welcome, but are we actively seeking out spaces where women are? So are we actively seeking out uh, opportunities and engaging with people who need to be brought into those spaces and encouraging them to participate and finding ways, whether it's providing childcare during edit-a-thons or whether it is providing a stipend potentially to pay for a babysitter or childcare if that is something that is needed or providing stipends for travel to that location, wherever the edit-a-thon may be. If, you know, getting an Uber or public transit, you know, is an opportunity, but maybe it's a cost prohibitive one, um, things like that. So um, it's improving, but I think we can do more, you know, just like any sort of diversity effort. Sure, we can say we're inclusive. Sure, we can say we want diverse people, but unless we actively go out there and seek those people out and engage with them to get them into the spaces, it's it's not going to change and not very fast. I mean, gosh, when was y'all have to help me out? Was it 2012 that it first came out about the gender gap? There was a first article published um, about it, um, but still, here we are eight years later, and not that much has changed. Um, in, in regards to content, we talk about quite a few people, um, Jess Wade, um, Emily Templewood, who have really, um, Rosie Stevens and Goodnight, who have really impacted and focused on women in their editing efforts. Um, <clears throat> and forgive me if I've missed some people, of course I have. Um, and of course, you know, Art and Feminism working on like deliberate aspects. And then also our co-author, Alexandra Lockett, um, Alexandria Lockett, she she actually works with uh, black women at Spelman College to get them to editing. And, and this, I actually have her article, she couldn't be here with us today, um, printed out her, her piece from the book. And it's she talks a lot about how authorship and people don't feel like they have the ability to edit. So unless we, we go out and engage with people and, and say, yes, you can edit this content. Yes, you have the authority. We're not going to get the content gap closed. We're also not going to get the um, the women involved in our efforts. And also, we might as, as well be being um, exclusionary to some men because some men might say, OK, look, I don't want to be in this effort if this is going to be exclusionary um, because some even some uh, some men and um, of course, they don't want to exclude um, all genders, um, but there I'm sure there are other people in the community who don't want to be involved with an effort that is not inclusive. Um, and that's a, a certain turnoff to them saying, well, if this is just going to be this, this group, I'm not going to join in because I'm going to just go affect um, the situation elsewhere. Yeah, Mako, you had some insights into the research on this back going back to 2008, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I was I, I was just going to say that I think that um, that that we talk about this a little bit in my in my chapter as well. Um, but the the gender gap in Wikipedia is actually one of the most studied like 
features of Wikipedia. Um, uh, and I think that uh, um, uh, bugs, and maybe, maybe <laughs> more, more a bug than a feature, perhaps. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and I think that, that uh, Jackie's point is totally correct. Um, although it's hard to summarize like a body of hundreds of papers, um, I guess they didn't stop myself and Aaron Shaw, my co-author, from trying. Uh, um, I think one important finding and a reason that uh, um, one important finding is that that the, the dynamics that play out in Wikipedia, and the reason it's actually, Wikipedia is important as sort of a laboratory for studying it, is that the kinds of dynamics, a lot of the kinds of things that, that, that Jackie just mentioned, are, are features of inequality, like gender inequality more broadly, um, that, are, that are also present in Wikipedia. And um, I think that that's, that's, that's bad and it's good. It means the problems, that, the problems are, 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 you know, deep and difficult to solve, but it also means that there's, a, you know, body of things that other people have done in other spaces and knowledge that we've built in other spaces that can be applied to the problem just as our understanding of how sort of inequality and bias and discrimination play out in Wikipedia um, as it relates to gender and to a range of other spaces um, uh, can be used to understand these phenomena, more, these phenomena more broadly as well. So. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's something where one thing that what you said makes me think of, Jackie, is this notion of intentionality. You know, I think in the early years of Wikipedia, we did not expect this to happen, right? We did not expect really to still be going 20 years later. We didn't expect to have 55 million articles, which is how many articles there are now across all of the language versions of Wikipedia. I think we sort of hoped and dreamed and thought, what if, and said, okay, we'll keep building it and see what happens. But uh, there wasn't this notion of stepping back, taking a good long look at ourselves and who's contributing and how can we bring uh, new people in, different people in. That has um, grown up over the years. Um, and I think this is now also a moment when we need to continue stepping back and taking a long, hard look at ourselves. Um, who can contribute? Who can't? How is it hard to contribute? Um, have the structures that we've built technically, socially, are they a barrier to contributing now? And I think that's particularly hard because the Wikipedia machine continues, right? Um, uh, it's it's kind of incredible. I mean, one common thread across uh, what Stephen and Sean were saying and Mako is that as Wikipedia has grown, all these fields looking at Wikipedia, libraries, journalism, researchers have all sort of been in astonishment with us. Like, look at this thing that we've built. And meanwhile, Wikipedia keeps growing. Um, Wikipedia contributors keep editing. And now, to bring it back to this notion of breaking news, Brian, every time something happens in the world that is notable, Wikipedia is on it. We have this, you know, massive group of contributors that jump on jump on a, a, a topic within seconds, it seems like, which um, is amazing and great. And also, I think, leads to people forgetting that it is individual contributors behind the scenes, you know, working away and making edits. It just seems like it just happens, like the air, you know. Um, but I was reminded of this most recently. Uh, this week has been an eventful week in US history. And I know you've been looking at that, too. Yeah, and I'm reminded that, you know, for all, when I was coming up as an undergraduate, the sort of the admonitions that librarians, professors would give us, but like not to trust Wikipedia to arrive here 15, 20 years later, that major platforms like YouTube and Facebook are now using Wikipedia or referring their own traffic to Wikipedia because they're able, unable or unwilling to deal with the deluge, uh, like socio-technical sludge, as I call it, of moderating the content on these platforms where Wikipedia has pioneered a bottom-up, community-led governance process for governing the content uh, on its platforms that has proved to be like remarkably resilient to the kinds of disinformation campaigns that uh, we've seen taken down other kinds of platforms. And so to have a platform like Wikipedia that, that builds itself as the website, as the encyclopedia that anyone can edit, and to think to something like 2016, where every other major social media platform is being dragged before the US Congress to justify like why these kinds of disinformation campaigns will have to proliferate 
the fact that Wikipedia wasn't there, I think, speaks a lot to the strength of the model that Wikipedia certainly did not uh, pioneer, but in many ways perfected through this process of community-led governance and involvement that has proven to be really resilient across so many different kinds of use cases, whether it's 16th century Italian poets or it's about insurrections in the United States that just happened last week. <laughs> and, and you had some observations in Twitter about this recently, right? So. Right. So uh, as a researcher who studies how Wikipedia responds to current events, you know, uh, whenever bad things happen in the world, uh, I get excited in this perverse kind of way, whether it's plane crashes or earthquakes. So that those are all new case studies for like going to my data. And so certainly the events of the last couple of weeks where we've had, you know, these upset elections in the U.S. Senate and Georgia, uh, runoff elections. We've had this uh, the the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. We've had this historic second impeachment of U.S. President. All these things that are happening in the space of weeks. Wikipedia again has demonstrated this remarkable ability to respond and like edit in really reliable and powerful ways about this. And so uh, I leverage the fact that Wikipedia also makes uh, is built on top of a platform media wiki that preserves all the changes that are made to every single one of these articles, uh, you know, going back all the way to 2001 or two, oftentimes. And so we can like see like how an article like Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump has changed in every single, what the content has looked like at every single moment in time on Wikipedia, all the way back to something like 2002 or 2004. Uh, and so for us, it provides this remarkable tool for historians uh, thinking about this and archivists uh, to think about how it was that like uh, people at the time were processing what was happening in the middle of all these kinds of uh, historic events. Uh, so I just did a brief uh, descriptive quantitative analysis of just what was happening on the storming of the United States Capitol page that was created uh, on January 6th, just again, hours after this event actually unfolded. And just again, it just it's remarkable to see just that the the huge amount of collaborative energy that is invested in producing these artifacts in the absence of there being any central editor. There's no person directing traffic here. The people who are coming to this article, the editors who are coming to this article to collaborate have widely different kinds of experience and qualifications. And in spite of all these kinds of things, and the, and the MediaWiki software itself is not designed to allow people to edit synchronously. And so you've got these very real social, organizational, and technical challenges. In spite of all of that, anyone who's ever tried to edit a Google document, for example, with you know one, two, five, ten other people has realized how quickly those coordination challenges mount. And, and then Wikipedia does this and has been doing this for 20 years, um, covering these current event articles, despite these social and technical challenges. And so what I did was I, I, I just pulled some of this open data that uh, the Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia serves up through the MediaWiki API about like how many changes were being made at different points in time. And so, uh, and we can also go back and like rewind the clock and look at like what this article looked like at every single point in time, what every single change looked like. And so you can see in this chart that uh, Andrew has up here now is that like just this huge spike of activity that happens, you know, in the hours after the storm and the insurrection at the US Capitol that there were 250, uh, at one point, one hour, there were 250 revisions being made in a single hour. Uh, so 250 changes being made. Uh, um, and, and so Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedian administrators can come in and, and start to like impose some blocks uh, to sort of like prevent people from coming in and, and disrupting this. And there's really good precedents for doing this. Mako has, has published looking at, the reports of looking at these page protection events uh, mm -hmm. for doing this kind of research. We see this huge initial surge of activity there on the left, and then it kind of like falls back down. You're still seeing like 50 edits, uh, revisions being made every single hour, even in the middle of the night sometimes, to this <laughs> one single article. And so what I did is I went through and like got every hundredth revision up to this article. So we can look at like what did this article look like? You know, like what were the links that were present on this article? And so I went and like got like so what was this article linking out to? It gives you a sense of like what people were talking about at the time. Uh, and so what I did is I, I just plotted out again in blue is just that you see this characteristic spike of like the 250 people editing, making the 250 revisions being made in that first hour, that kind of falling back down. But this Wikipedia article about the storming of the U.S. Capitol ultimately over the course of its just week history has linked out to a thousand different articles. And some of those links have come and gone. We'll look at that in a second. But those thousand other articles are all somehow implicated in this event as well. Like this is about articles about the US Capitol, articles about Donald Trump, all those articles needed to get updated as well. And you can see 
not only was there editing activity on the US, uh, this insurrection storming article as well, there's a huge amount of editing activity and a huge number of new editors coming in and updating these other kinds of articles about these pre-existing uh, topics, whether it's the US Capitol or Washington DC or the presidency of the United States or Donald Trump, all the other things needed to be updated as well. Uh, and then finally there in orange, we see just the number of editors who are active on the impeachment article. So there was an article created about the second impeachment, or what will become the second impeachment of Donald Trump was created all, all the way back in January uh, 7th, you know, just fully, uh, uh, you know, just hours again after this event unfolded, people were starting to edit that article as well. Uh, and again, with the impeachment happening on the 14th, just yesterday, that uh, we can see this spike of activity on that. Mm -hmm. um, this chart here just does a really nice job also just capturing how the length of these articles have changed over time. So again, this uh, article in blue is just how long the article for the storming, how quickly that article grew. Again, in the space of just hours, that article grew to be longer than the thousand other articles you know, that are about 75 kilobytes. This green line is a, the sample of about these other thousand articles. Most articles in Wikipedia about 75 kilobytes is what they're saying. And this article about the storming of the US Capitol got that long and longer in the space of just a couple of hours. And certainly the article about the impeachment uh, got as longer and longer than most of these other art related articles in the space of about a week. And so not only are there a lot of editors, there are a lot of revisions being made, like these articles are getting long very fast. It's an incredibly hard coordination challenge how to manage this, but if they, this is these are robust findings that happen for earthquakes, for plane crashes, for VIPs dying, for elections, that like this is such a robust finding across all these Wikipedia. Its ability to respond to these events is just one of the things I find remarkable and what I really dedicated my research career to is like trying to understand how Wikipedia accomplishes this over and over again. Yeah, that's, that's so fascinating. I mean, if you think about it, can you think of another event that would have so many reverberations? Because you had 538 senators and Congress people there, so everyone's updating content about their congressperson or their senator. I mean, just think about the ripples throughout that. I wonder if other folks in the panel had reactions to this and uh, from a research standpoint, just from a phenomenon standpoint. Yeah, well, well my first reaction was that I, I, I need to reach out to Brian next time there's breaking news because I can certainly <laughs> use this data um, for a piece. But uh, but I, I'll just kind of, I, I alluded to the, um, the, the, I guess, the controversy of what to name the article and a recent article for Slate, the storming, the storming now called storming article, storming of the Capitol article on Wikipedia. And I just wanted to give this this kind of insight because I think there are a lot of, you know, non-experienced Wikipedians and kind of the general public who reads those journalist art, journalistic articles. And I'd say the most common comment is, you know, why is Wikipedia not calling it a coup or an insurrection or, or terrorism, you know what? What what's what's the um, what's the issue there? Come on, Wikipedia. And what's what's happening is I still think a lot of people don't really understand, you know, Wikipedia policies and kind of how decisions are reached via consensus. The idea being that you know Wikipedia is not original research, and that, that you know on this article and others, it's trying to reflect what it, how is the mainstream uh, or the reliable uh, press coverage, in fact, covering this event. What nomenclature are they using? I think what's hard about this one in particular is you can find articles that are, you know, uh, you know, from legitimate publications that are describing it as insurrection, um, terrorism, et cetera. But um, just just thought it was an interesting uh, uh, kind of reflection on, you know, what what how do non Wikipedians think about it when you describe uh, Wikipedia news in in the news? Right, and and it's it's just fascinating to see in stark graph form and i never looked at this way either brian just kind of how we've we've gone from like live event coverage and then it's crossed over into impeachment coverage which is kind of a longer term thing and you see that starkly on that graph which is quite fascinating as people break off sections of the fast article and start turning them into different products within our ecosystem, right? Yeah, and one thing that's remarkable about this too is I think even people who know a lot maybe about Wikipedia, they might have hypotheses like, oh, this is just like 10 editors who like own this page and are just like controlling things. But like, in fact, and against this robust finding across lots of ways that Wikipedia covers current events, that there's an incredible amount of dynamicism in terms of the kinds of people who are coming in and participating in these articles and leaving. There's an incredible amount of turnover in terms of like who's participating and who gets to participate. And certainly there are limits imposed uh, I think correctly so, as we think about like content moderation, uh, that like who's allowed to edit, participate. I think Wikipedia has pioneered a model that uh, like is very sort of strict and sort of very low tolerance about people engaging in shenanigans that like you're, they're quick to block, they're quick to lock down the protection of the pages. And I think 
uh, you know, but at the same time, Wikipedia operates under a very different kind of set of incentives than lots of other social platforms where you're not trying to like deliver these like engagement numbers to advertisers. Right. And that allows you to take very different kinds of actions in terms when you have a, a mass convergence attention event like these that where you have bad faith actors coming in and trying to disrupt things that Wikipedia is fine saying we're shutting things down, we're only let people we trust make changes here. Uh, is very different than like how Facebook operates its newsfeed or how Twitter operates its trending topics uh, that are much less human in the loop and rely a lot more on automated tools. And we're starting to see the limits of that. And so I think Wikipedia 20 years in should take a lot of pride for continuing to center the human in so many of its processes, but for generating content and governing that content. Right. Well, I think you hit on it. Like the funny thing is our software is pretty much hate to say it, but the same as it is 20 years ago, like it really isn't collaborative in any way that you think if you look at Google Docs, right? It's kind of one at a time entry into the locking of the article in some sense, but um, maybe some folks could reflect on that. Uh, we, we haven't really upgraded the technical <laughs> platform as much as we could have over 20 years, right? Um. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. But I want to go back to to this notion of knowledge and how we how we how we think about how we think about references and our categorization. Uh, Sean, I know you uh, have written about that, and it it's connected to our software for sure. But yeah, um, one of the things I was thinking about when Brian was talking was really I wrote about this. Well, we wrote about this in the chapter. The the co-founders um, that one of the events that really catalyzed the founding of art and feminism was Amanda Filipacci's piece in the New York Times about this category of um, American novelists and um, this you know that had become this bloated category that was huge, right? So basically, one editor went in and was like, "I'm gonna just move all the women." to American women novelists, which ended up in this purging of um, women from American novelists, which is, you know, problematic. And so there's this piece and part of what art and feminism wanted to do was kind of bring together the conversations that were happening on Wikipedia because it, you know, it's that invisibility of those conversations that are happening on talk pages um, about like, is this appropriate? How do we categorize this? How do we make these categories usable? Um, that is, you know, part of what we wanted to do is not just have it be like, oh, there's this overarching sort of like overlord who's moving these things, but rather that it's a kind of community decision and that these conversations were happening there as well as outside of Wikipedia and kind of trying to bring more women into those types of discussions in on the platform itself. And I think it's also just as, as Phoebe was maybe highlighting inherently interesting as librarians, because, you know, this is a conversation librarians are having constantly about things like subject headings and how we, um, you know, how we define things in library catalogs and how they're inherently problematic. For example, queer is not in, um, is not a, uh, a it's, it's not a subject heading, right? So it's like, there's these complicated things that um, librarians spend a lot of time thinking about how we categorize information and make it available to people and searchable and usable, but um, you know how we also replicate structural racism and sexism in, in, in doing that. Um, and yeah, maybe I would throw it to Phoebe to kind of like <laughs> jump in there on, on how that relates to Wikipedia and sort of structures of categorization on Wikipedia, which have a, a very different mode of functioning than LOC, for example. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I tried to write about in my chapter is this um, sort of parallel history of libraries and Wikipedia, right, uh, where, you know, in the beginning, librarians were skeptical of this hobbyist website, as is totally appropriate, and now uh, have gone to this place of working closely with Wikipedia as, you know, contributors to the project. And um, but Wikipedia has this more fundamental epistemological problem or, or feature and bug, I think, which uh, Brian was talking about, which is we rely on the outside world. We rely on outside references to document the world. We are a tertiary source. We do not report original research. And what that means is we are reliable, we are factual, we are neutral. What it also means is that we are subject to the biases of whatever the sources in the world are, right? And I think we see this over and over and over again across languages, um, across writing about uh, minority groups or just, you know, people who have been written out of history in the past. And 
I think, you know, as librarians, Wikipedia has in some ways taught us how to grapple with these questions um, in a in a in a kind of new way. Um, yeah, the categorization stuff, I mean, I'll throw it to I'll throw it to um, all of you to talk about technology. I mean, it is true. Our technology is still clunky, uh, <laughs> which is kind of heartwarming and charming, I think, in many ways, uh, but also makes it hard to use. Uh, it makes it hard for new people to get started. Um. So I have to jump off here. I apologize. I have to go lecture here for my own class, my first class of the semester. But I guess one thread I wanted to connect here between Sean and Danny was that uh, you know Danny and, and Mako had alluded to the fact that Wikipedia and Wikidata is increasingly being ingested by Google for helping with machine translation or Facebook to help with content moderation or for Amazon with their Alexa for like voice assistance and things like that. And so like all the biases and, and at that Wiki, whether it's systematic or otherwise that Wikipedians have or Wikidata editors have are putting into these systems are then being ingested and amplified in, into these massive technical architectures that aren't just being found on Wikipedia anymore, but are like every user of Facebook or Google or Google Translate or Alexa are now in some ways indirectly experiencing this. One of my favorite case studies of this was that if you asked Siri or uh, back in October 2018 what the national anthem of Bulgaria was, it would return Despacito, which is like this <laughs> reggaeton pop hit. So somewhere deep down in like Apple's knowledge graph, probably which was ingested from Wikidata in some kinds of ways, this not this key value pair was erroneously linked in. No one checked it, and then it was blasted out theoretically to like everyone who could use Siri, which is you know hundreds of millions of people around the world. And so I was wondering if both of you could reflect on that as I sign off here. But thank you for having me, and congratulations to Wikipedia and everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for your work. <clears throat> Yeah, in information reliability, that's also something going forward, right? It's it's as much as we're patting ourselves on the back and the journalism uh, folks are patting our, us on the back, there's still a lot of problems that we have, right? Yeah, for sure. And um, Denny, you have been thinking about languages, I know, and I think it's important to talk about languages at this moment, right? Uh, we're, we're not just in English, Wikipedia. Um, You're muted, Denny. Let me. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, totally. So one of the things that uh, we have been talking about now is, for example, the English Wikipedia is so good at covering all these recent events and so on. But this is not necessarily always true for the different languages um, of Wikipedia, in which sometimes are much, much slower, have ma many fewer people there. So I did um, make, I'm not sure how to share my screen. Oh, um, it's up here now. Perfect. So I did, as I did this analysis back then when London Breed became um, mayor of uh, San Francisco. And what we see here is a timeline of um, London Breed became mayor. And down at the bottom, we see the language editions and when they switch to London Breed being the mayor. And we can see that some language decisions switched basically already like half a year before it actually happened um, because this was supposed to be used when the previous mayor died and she became interim mayor and so on. And for others, it just like took months and weeks and, and so on. So um, <coughs> it's, uh, we always look, we will often look at the Wikipedias for this is the, uh, uh, the English Wikipedia is the Wikipedia, and that's basically it. And we analyze it uh, with the, the impact on, on the world through the lens of the English Wikipedia. Um, like this week, there was news, one billion edits of Wikipedia. Well, so again, only English Wikipedia, we also have the other projects. Um, and in many of those projects, the things are not moving as quickly, as fast. And for London, for San Francisco, for example, the mayor was in, many Wikipedias was not only like one mayor ago or two mayor, but it was basically the mayor at the time when the article was written. Um, and in, which often was like, it's the mayor from 2004, 2005. And in one uh, Wikipedia, Cebuano, actually the mayor was Diane Feinstein, who was who became mayor in 1968 when um, Harry Milk um, Which, <laughs> and, and we, we can't really, um, we, we don't really 
make this um, we, we don't really often look at those different languages and, and how they represent the knowledge. And the other thing is we don't know if the differences that we have here, and this is coming back to Brian's point that you just made, are accidental or intentional. Is this a difference because this language community wants to represent the information differently? Or is this a difference because, um, well, it's just not up to date or we just didn't have enough resources in this language to actually write on these articles. Um, and and then one of the goals of AppSec Wikipedia is actually to, to cover this up, to, to find out whether differences are intentional or not. We still will have local Wikipedias writing local articles on topics which are of local importance and have a different cultural view on it. But, you know, I don't think that Cebuano has a particular attachment to Diane Feinstein as a mayor of San Francisco, and that this is an intentional um, entry there that didn't update it since then. Um, and, and, and we need to make this difference, and we have to understand this. One point that Brian raised, and just to to give then uh, Xian an opportunity to comment on that, is well. We are reflecting, is, is, is Siri, is uh, Google, are the others just reflecting the biases from Wikipedia? And then the answer is, yes, sure. But what would be the alternative? Um, what would be, uh, at least here we have a community um, maintained resource that the tech companies are reflecting for the AI, um, uh, for the AI systems. The alternative would be that they would be get, take, taking this data from some um, commercial entity from uh, um, that, that would be in control of that, where we don't have any say in that. The magic of Wikipedia is that we all can contribute, some easier, some less easy, but we all can contribute to the content in Wikipedia. We, it, it is our common... Um, our common property that we all can work on together. And it's not just, you know, well, it's decided by the editorial board of the Encyclopedia Britannica and we'll have to wait until they, uh, they fix something and so on. Um, nothing against Britannica. I love the classical uh, encyclopedias, but we, we don't have any. Um, the, the magic of Wikipedia is that it came right at the moment where I and technology needed this kind of thing and created a resource that now I hope that we will never go back to a, to a place where control over knowledge is handed to a small number of companies and organizations and that Wikipedia will make it impossible to, to put this uh, control back to that. And yes, we might complain about, you know, there are only 10, 15, 20% of, uh, of, um, of the editors being women and so on. You might complain that there are a lot of people who are not represented well, and this is all true, and I, I really want this to change. But compare how it was before that. How, how many women were on the editorial board, editorial board of Britannica? How many underrepresented minorities were, uh, have been writing articles um, in, the, in, the, in the big encyclopedias? I mean, yes, we are not representative of the world at large yet, definitely not. But I think we are a very, very important step from how the world has been before that, and we want to change. We shouldn't be dismissive of where we are just because we didn't achieve the whole goal yet. Um, we should be, um, we should also look at how we are improving things and that we are trying to be inclusive, that we are trying to, to work towards um, allowing more people to contribute. We need more modalities for our knowledge. Um, we need more modalities for contributions. So it shouldn't be always, you know, you have to sit down on a big screen, you need to have a book next to you and, and write art, full articles and so on. We need to find many, many more ways to contribute, many, many more ways to consume what we have and um, and to access the knowledge that, we, that we're making available from many, many channels. And Again, uh, to, to Brian's point, I totally agree. Yes, we are not yet there, um, but I think we have made a huge step forward to compare to how it was before, and we um, and we should continue doing that. And we should never rest on our laurels. Okay, maybe today it's a birthday after all, <laughs> but um, but besides that, we really should push towards more inclusion in in 
not only in representation, but also in the kinds of modalities that we so, that we accept, in the kinds of knowledge that we uh, that we take, but also and and very importantly in the in in who is represented um, in our contributor base, and also in the knowledge that we are creating. Yeah, I think that's well said, and we did not even mention the twenty thirty strategy. Uh, in this call, but anyone who's been participating in those conversations in their community knows that that's one of the long-term goals. And I think, Denny, I think your point is right. That at least we have the framework to improve. Whereas if you didn't have Wikipedia, you'd be stuck with very old actors set in their ways that cannot evolve to improve the situation. Yeah. But uh, Sean, I'm wondering whether you uh, you or, or Phoebe can talk in the context of librarians, um, because you know we found that engagement with things like Wikidata are actually a lot more exciting for librarians than Wikipedia. You know, it's something that we run into all the time where Wikipedians, I'm sorry, librarians have said, oh yeah, Wikipedia is great, but you know, we librarians, we don't write articles, so it's not really resonating with us. But once you start talking about Wikidata and identifiers and uh, linked open data, we found that a lot more librarians have engaged in many ways with Wikidata than Wikipedia. So I'm wondering if you've seen that or what are the what's the impact of Wikidata been in your area of work, um, whether it's librarianship or, or art history. Um, yeah, I mean, I also want to go back to to some of what Denny was saying too about like the the nature of the community, and you know, I'm certainly um, you know of the belief that it's it's better to have these open source projects, and that's part of, as I said earlier, why art and feminism does what we do. You know, we often. Uh, get sort of, and, and as you may, if you've read our chapter, you know our chapter is a particularly difficult one because it is kind of about community and gatekeeping and also harassment. Um, but what we wrote at the end of the chapter was that we do this because we believe in it, right? Um, like in the same way that, you know, I was in library school when they announced Digital Public Library of America was going to be a thing. And I didn't actually think it was going to be a thing. I was like, yeah, right, LOL. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it, it was. And part of why librarians championed it is because even though Google has all the money in the world and can do all the things, they're not beholden to publics, right? Um, whereas that is the beauty of Wikipedia, right? We have the ability to change these things. We have the ability to try and um, create more equitable communities. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think one of the things going forward that Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation and the community needs to do is really build out trust and safety, is really build out these kind of things that, that Jackie was talking about at the beginning um, to, to try and make people feel welcome. I mean, I've literally had people come up to me and say, I would never have participated in Wikipedia if it hadn't been through an art and feminism edit-a-thon because I needed to feel that there were people who supported us. And we just happen to know wonderful Wikipedians, you know, around like Richard Nipel, a huge shout out, <laughs> for example, um, to kind of like bring in people and make them feel shepherded and comfortable in, in this place that can be difficult. Um, so I, I want to kind of acknowledge that tension uh, for me. And then I think, um, I think, yeah, to the point about, uh, about structured data, you know, the, the thing I love about librarians is there's so many kinds of us, you know, like there's law librarians, nursing librarians, art librarians. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of librarians really see the value of structured data structured metadata and like what that does for discoverability and findability, because that's a big part of what we do. And, and I agree, I think Wikidata has been huge, art and feminism, um, specifically Michael Mandeberg, um, and, and also one of our uh, our now lead organizers, Mohammed, has been doing a ton of stuff with Wikidata on behalf of art and feminism. It's been really wonderful and game changing for us in seeing as well as like um, the output of our edit-a-thons and uh, like articles that we can improve that are being already created at art and feminism edit-a-thons, which is which we weren't able to do for for so long. So that's been a huge, huge um, you know bo bonus for for us and I think for a lot of librarians. And I'll, I'll throw it to maybe Phoebe to kind of jump in more on the structured data, Wikidata side. Yeah, I mean, Wikidata, speaking less as a librarian, I think more as a Wikimedian, Wikidata has been this total game changer, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has more edits than Wikipedia now and has a, a, a huge contributor base and is slowly growing to be this really powerful thing. And what I have said to people in the past is, uh, you know, we're building Wikidata. It's super cool. We don't exactly know what we're going to do with it yet, but it's going to be very cool, right? And I feel like 
I feel like the early days of Wikipedia were a little bit like that too, right? We started writing articles and we were like, we're not entirely sure what this is going to turn into or what we're going to do with it, but it seems like it's going to be very cool. Um, so, I mean, for me, I think the promise of Wikidata is yet to come, really. I mean, we've already solved many structural technical problems with it, like linking between language versions and linking between meanings of terms and articles. But I think the real promise is yet to come for uh, cataloging data sets, uh, looking at um, describing uh, things in in across language editions, looking at collecting references, potentially all of these all of these projects. And yeah, I really I'm I'm thinking about the future a lot on this anniversary. So I'll I'll give it back to you, Andrew, because um, that was one of the questions we had, I think, about you know, where do we go from here? What, you know, after 20 years, a milestone that many of us didn't really expect to reach. Uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, I think it's a it's a good way to to spend the rest of our time is, you know, what what should what's the next 20 years look like or what should the next 20 years look like? We we're, we're lucky that Denny is already charting the course forward here. Um but he's he's been part of a movement within our movement which is what we find is common, let's put it in one place and increase our efficiencies, right? We did it with Wikimedia Commons. If you don't remember, uh you know, there are pictures in every single edition of Wikipedia and they weren't consolidated. So Wikimedia Commons was made to centralize photos and images. Now we have a whole community that does only that. Uh, Wikidata is the same thing for knowable facts. Abstract Wikipedia is trying to do the same thing with um, uh, generating text and prose. Uh, but you know, one of the things I throw out there is citations. And I think this is something that Sean touched on originally. If folks don't know, the way we do citations Wikipedia is stone age. It is so poor. <laughs> <laughs> that if you cite one publication, one article, and you want to go to another article, you've got to recite and reparse and redo the, the same thing. There's no database of citations in Wikipedia. Think about that. There is no database of our citations. They're just bytes on each page. So um, I know there are ways that we are moving forward with that, with the Wikisite project, but that's one thing I think must be done. Not 20 years, like hopefully 20 months from now it'll be done. <laughs> but uh, other ideas, throw them out there in terms of things we need to do sooner or later in the, in the movement. So one of the things I was thinking about is in my chapter in the book, I was reflecting on all the people who had predicted that Wikipedia wouldn't turn out to be much or they underestimated it or they thought it was going to die. And I said it never died. In fact, it continues to live. And the somewhat trivial ending I put on that is the lesson I'd learned from that is not to make predictions about the future, especially <laughs> about Wikipedia, but I will nonetheless venture and say Wikipedia is not gonna die. Um, but it's interesting, I, in some ways, pillory, pillory a couple of people in that essay. And one of the things that didn't happen for the book that I was thinking about is I would have loved to have gotten some of those original critics like the former chair of the ALA or Nicholas Carr and say, okay, where do you stand now? But nonetheless, one of the people on this uh, web webinar, web call, I actually do cite. And that was you, Andrew, yeah. because three or four years ago, you were um, freaking out about mobile. And so uh, as people go around and maybe reflect on the future, I would be curious if, if you're still worried about the mobile and what other people think are the great opportunities and the great challenges for Wikipedia. Yeah, um, my, my mobile shtick is... Um, we need to get not only more mobile friendly, but we need to embrace multimedia and interactive media. So if you think about it, you know, my book that I wrote about this is called The Wikipedia Revolution, but I've concluded after 20 years or 17 years, the only thing revolutionary about Wikipedia at this point is how we combine forces and collaborate globally in multi-languages multi to write a very conventional encyclopedia. Okay, and that, that might be very controversial, but if you look at Wikipedia's pages, you know, if you put more than n number of images, you get pushed back, you get uh, reverted. If you try to put video in there, you'll often get reverted, saying serious encyclopedias don't have all those images and videos in it. And I think we're still in that mode in many ways. So if you think about the number one sites out there for how to do things, YouTube and TikTok and all this stuff, we're completely not addressing visual learning or learning by video, all these things we know are modalities that work. So um, some of that is technical standards, some is just cultural. We don't have a community to do that. So I still think that the mobile 
uh, side of things, we're really missing out on something there. Um, but in other areas like Wikidata and creating the, the actual structured content that is useful to Apple and Google and the big tech, that's absolutely healthy. That's great. But um, I do worry that we're not really hitting this other area of like interactive multimedia visual learning. But I'd love to hear from other folks. What are some of the things you predict that we need to try to do in the next 20 years? Maybe. Yeah, I fully agree with that. We really need to expand how the modalities that we accept and form some contributions. And um, it was mentioned now that Wikidata is great success. One of the things that people were afraid of when Wikidata started was that it would be cannibalizing the Wikipedia communities, that a lot of it, that it would draw people from the Wikipedia to Wikidata. But that's not what happens. Sure, a few people are active on both projects and few people have moved from the other projects, but I think those people have been prone to the kind of Wikidata contributions anyway. But what we have seen is that it has, we have put in thousands and thousands of people who have never contributed to the Wikimedia projects before because the way that you uh, contribute to Wikidata is so different. The same is true for comments. And not everyone likes to write Wikipedia articles and likes to write the kind of Wikipedia um, the kind of articles that Wikipedia likes. We really should open us for more modalities of knowledge. And this is not just video. Uh, video has some problems regarding its editability and so on, which we really, we really should figure out. I know that, um, that there are people thinking about this. Um, but, um, and also like, how can we actually have mobile contributions. The funny thing is, which for me is really uh, painful to see, is that Wikidata, which seems to be actually really uh, amenable to editing from, from mobile, has a terrible mobile editing interface, and it's it's completely broken. But on the other side, such as you know, editing, it's also like, what can you do when you're on mobile and you want to add? I mean. How often do you know the birthday of a person that well? You still need the references. You still need to look up stuff. It's not just you know the actual editing. It's also the whole infrastructure around it. Can you actually edit and so on? And one thing that I would really love us to see is to actually allow to contribute knowledge to our to the Wikimedia. I'm explicitly not saying to Wikipedia itself, but to the Wikimedia universe that goes well beyond what we are used. Um, in uh, with, with, with well-referenced Wikipedia articles. I'd love to have the local oral histories and somehow capture them in, in, a, in, a, in a workflow. Um, to capture them, then to, to, to write them down and, and then start comparing it with other people. It's a kind of original research in certain areas, but, but connected with the encyclopedia, but also apart from it, I don't know how exactly, obviously we need to figure that out as a community. Um, but, uh, but but there are so many different ways to accept, to accept and, and bring in more knowledge. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to see us do much, much work, much more work in the next 20 years on becoming much wider. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have such a low diversity um, in many areas is that, well, we are building for the encyclopedia for this idea that the few French guys came up with in the 18th century, more or less. Um, and we are thinking that this is the way to describe the whole world for everyone. And I'm not sure if this is necessarily true. And um, the future will be extremely fascinating with, you know, AI being able to bring in knowledge and to, to, to flow it for, for, for ways we can't even imagine today. To And we, we should be the ones providing the substrate, providing ways for, for the whole world to engage and contribute their knowledge so that all voices can actually be reflected in that future that will be mediated through technology and allowed to answer many, many more questions than today. And this, this is where we really need all the voices heard and um, we need to figure out how we can be in that place to do that. Yeah, Great, wanna... who wants to take on the next? Oh, get Jackie, go ahead. I'll pick up on this. Um, yeah. yeah, and actually I think um, there's several of us in this group here and as Stephen was mentioning that video sounded like something that would be interesting for the future as well. So I think a lot of us are excited about that. And Denny, I'm very on board with oral histories. So yeah, maybe this is something that in the next five, 10 years we can uh, figure out and, and get get taken care of. 
And actually I have, um, because Alexandria Lockett could not be here with us today, I, I printed out her chapter and I have highlighted some, some aspects um, and something here that really stands out in this conversation uh, would be um, because Alexandria works with uh, black women at Spelman and they were concerned about any Wikipedia and do I have that authority? Um, she said, there were concerns revealed that our communities need to take radical action to reckon with the historical and pre uh, present problem of black women recovering and documenting our intellectual and cultural history. And so I hope that that's something that we can really take a hold of and recognize how important histories that aren't documented or haven't been documented are just being lost every single day. And that's that's one thing that I really am passionate about because I've um, I've taken on recording several of people in my local community that are historians or um, you know actors or just community people who knew what you know what was here before any of us in this current time and so it's it's something that's sad that even though their their knowledge is not documented in any sort of historical way which of course that's dependent on the aspect you're looking on with, um, you know, is it notable or not? Well, what is notable? Is that decided by a small cohort of people who uh, decided that they were, you know, people who were able to make that decision? But unfortunately, that's excluding a lot of cultures and histories and real things that are important to uh, our community and society as a whole. And going back a second to uh, what Denny was mentioning and, uh, earlier is that I am not at all saying that Wikipedia hasn't come a long way. We wouldn't be here having these conversations uh, if Wikipedia weren't already amazing. Um, but I think that we need to say yes and. So yes, Wikipedia is amazing, but yes, it can be way cooler because uh, we can be more inclusive with uh, additional people um, who are currently excluded from these these decision-making processes on notability, on uh, verifiability of knowledge, because that's some, those are the two things that we struggle desperately uh, with containing and maintaining knowledge um, that is not necessarily documented in these Western ways that we consider um, to be notable on Wikipedia. So these are challenges that we need to overcome and hopefully in the very short future, uh, very near future, we can overcome these things with some of the um, some of the things that are going to be in play and coming to play from the uh, Wikimedia 2030 project. I'm really hopeful for a lot of those uh, those pieces. But there again, that depends on our intentionality and how we're going to take that forward as a community and um, as a society. So we need to stop instead of asking ourselves, well, is that what we've done on Wikipedia? We need to ask what's good for society, what's really important to the knowledge. So just like librarians have this um, call to knowledge and they, you know, just to honor the knowledge and the content, we need to take a little bit of, we need to take a page out of their book or several pages um, and take that as a, as a passion and really recognize we need to honor what is there and what should be there, not just what has been happening so that we can step back a little bit outside of ourselves. Um, so I think sometimes it's so difficult to step away when we're talking about these things. Uh, we get so focused and very passionate thinking, oh, well, this is the way things been done, but uh, not really recognizing how things could be and uh, recognizing those voices instead of um, silencing them using the notability standards um, or their policies, uh, really elevating those voices. So hopefully that'll be something for the future. Yeah. Mako, do you want to add something about the future here? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I, can, I, can, I can work up to the future. I mean, I think this has been a really great conversation. And I think that um, I see uh, a lot of connections between uh, the very sort of, you know, the, the range of things people have talked about. So, you know, I think that your point, Andrew, about Wikipedia being a very conventional encyclopedia is totally right. And it actually, um, it reminds me a little bit of some findings I had from a study I did. Um, gosh, it's called it's called Almost Wikipedia, um, and it was uh, uh, you can search for it and find it on my website. But it was a study of the uh, seven previous attempts, the seven attempts to create online collaborative encyclopedias in English before Wikipedia, and none of which, of course, became Wikipedia because um, uh, Wikipedia did. Um, and 
One of the findings was exactly this idea about conventionality. It was this idea that Wikipedia was super innovative um, about how it was going to go about building the encyclopedia, but deeply conventional in terms of what it is that it was trying to do. Um, um, another finding, uh, which is related to some stuff that's come up in this conversation, was that uh, that Wikipedia was um, like of all of those efforts, like it put the least time and energy and effort into the technology. It just like literally took a piece of software that someone else had written and just like put it on the web and said, let's, yeah, it's got a problem. Every article has to start with a capital letter and have another capital letter somewhere in it, but like, we'll just go with it. Um, and today you like, we have JavaScript sort of like making the iPod like uh, I smaller. Um, and I think that, that um, which is not to say that like, you know, tech doesn't matter or that being conventional, like uh, in terms of what our goals are, is always good. Being conventional helped because it meant that when people showed up, we didn't have to argue about what it is that we were doing, which all the other communities did all the time. Um, uh, it helped, um, uh, but, but, uh, but, it, but it did mean that people sort of like could hit the ground running. Um, uh, it also doesn't mean that the choices have served us well, or, um, but I think that in the sense that, that, I think that in many cases they've translated into real liabilities like a gender gap, like harassment, like systematic undercoverage that corresponds to inequality in the world and in other places. Um, uh, and many of these have afflicted sort of previous encyclopedia efforts, and some of them are sort of new to us. Um, uh, um, and uh, in some cases, we've maybe even aggravated them. But I think it gets at one sort of meta finding at my, uh, from, from my sort of broader research, which I think points to the future, which is that, that one thing I found when I've compared sort of these hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of attempts to build, you know, communities like Wikipedia and a range of places is the kinds of things that are predictors of early stage success are very often not predictors. Sometimes they're even like inversely prediction, the pr prediction of stagnation later on. That the kinds of things that we can do, which like help get a bunch of people onto this, literally onto the same page um, to help build the thing are not the kinds of things which are going to help us once we're already big sort of continue that or you know, build something, you know, build something better. And so I think that the, the future is in some sense wrestling with a bunch of trade-offs that we made early on. And I think that's also our present in some sense. Um, uh, and I think that, uh, that, 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 you know, we've succeeded in, in large part because in, in, you know, the things that have served us well are not necessarily going to be the, the things that serve us best moving forward and, f and sort of navigating that and arguing about that and figuring out that in the way that, you know, we as Wikipedians do um, is I think that, that what I see is my sort of big hope for the project moving forward. Great. Well said. Well, good context for that. Uh, how about Stephen? What are some of your, your thoughts about the future? Yeah, just thinking about the future, I I'd, I'd build off a, a lot of what Jackie and also Sean have said. You know, I'm interested, and in, and I think it's really important for Wikipedia to increase the size and the diversity of its contributor base. And I kind of want that for for two reasons. The first is unselfish, in the sense that I want the encyclopedia encyclopedia to continue to improve and to be more re representative of the world and more comprehensive. All those good things. The the very selfish reason is I don't want you know covering Wikipedia to uh, be a journalistic niche. I'd like it to be a broad a topic with a lot of interest. I think it touches on so many things. So, so I want it for both reasons. And I don't think we'll have time necessarily today, but there was a good comment in the chat um, about kind of political attempts to discredit Wikipedia. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I, without really getting into it or, or saying, you know, I have all the answers, certainly not. Um, I do think that that will be a challenge for Wikipedia going forward. There will be attempts by politicians to try to discredit Wikipedia largely, but not, not always on the right. And um, uh, I'm not sure how Wikipedia will be able to dodge those attacks. Yeah, that's a great point. We, maybe a whole nother episode just about, you know, <laughs> reputationally what Wikipedia kind of looks like. If you look at, if you listen to Twitter as some barometer, which is not a great idea, but we're seeing chatter that we haven't seen in the past, which is kind of interesting. Um, but how about Sean? What are your, some of your predictions for the future of the next 20 years of Wikipedia? Oh, I think I would just echo similarly, like what what Jackie was saying. That I, you know, my hopes for it are that um, you know, projects like art and fe feminism continue to be supported. That um, projects that really reflect like the human diversity of our sort of like historical record um, continue to be uh, supported. And I saw that a number of people were really excited about oral histories, 
um, you know, I think we, we really need to think about, you know, different types of knowledge, um, different, and, you know, this is something that's happening in the li library field as well as on Wikipedia, right, of like, how do we um, bring in indigenous knowledges? How do we bring in different ways of, uh, of recording and distributing knowledge? So I think that's going to be a huge thing that Wikipedia can and should wrestle with in order to be a truly sort of representative encyclopedia in a really revolutionary way that doesn't, as we said, just sort of represent this sort of traditional idea of uh, of what an encyclopedia is, because I think there's an opportunity to be, you know, so much more than that. Right, right. Oh, Jenny, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know we're running to the end. I never had a good opportunity. This is from the famous 2007 Wikimania Globe. Mm -hmm. um, and one piece was <laughs> broken off like this. Oh my God, actually. And I kept it over the years in my office, first in Karlsruhe. Now I don't have an office right now, but um, <laughs> yeah, so it's one of the artifacts from the last 20 years. <laughs> I have one of the little ones. Yeah. <laughs> one of the little puzzles from 2007. Yeah, I just have a single piece. You, you got off better than <laughs> yeah, I did. did. <laughs> That one. Exactly. Yeah, we 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 uh, should have told everyone to bring their favorite mementos. So if you didn't know, this was, as Danny said, the famous puzzle sphere, like gigantic puzzle sphere that was there sitting for the entire conference. At the very end, you, we smashed it, and everyone was supposed to bring a little puzzle piece home. And um, I don't know if it, this is widely known, but the funny thing was, Jimmy was giving a TV interview, like a TV news interview, with his back to this thing. And he didn't know this was going to happen, and everyone came in and smashed it, and he jumped out of his <laughs> pants right on television <laughs> while this was happening. So, one of the weird things about Wikipedia lore is uh, the smashing of the globe. Well, you know, um, Andrew, not to be too uh, hyperbolic here, but I think this is the note that I would go out on, right? <laughs> Over, not the smashing of the globe, but the fact that we do have a piece of it. Like we have all walked away with a piece of Wikipedia in one way or another. And I think we have to figure out how to, how to um, make that possible for other people. You know, make the sense that you, as a person coming in to this project, can own a piece of it, can be responsible for making it better, um, that you're part of a community that is working together to make it better. Um, that is the magic of Wikipedia. That's the joy. You know, it's not the technology, which, as we've talked about, is super clunky. It's not the, you know, ins and outs of our processes. It's this fact that we welcome people in to get their hands on a piece of building this knowledge together. And um, that's what I want to see in the next 20 years is for us to hang on to that ideal and continue it and not take it for granted and teach other people how to be a part of it um, so we can maintain that core. Well said. And, and so thank you everyone for being here on the panel. And um, this has been really fun and any, and all of you are welcome back to just do a dedicated episode on one of 15, 20 great topics we talked about. And each one of those could be all our topic. I mean, it's just uh, so much we could talk about in here. And uh, folks should come back. We're going to try to do more programming now that you know the 20th birthday has passed. And maybe we can take a breath now that uh, uh, 2021 has come. We'll see what happens. Uh, but welcome back to... Um, watching the Wikipedia weekly shows, and we'll try to do more. So thanks uh, to this panel. Uh, tell us a little bit again, uh, Phoebe, about the site, the PubPub -pub site. Sure. So the address at the bottom of the screen, wikipedia20.pubpub.org, uh, has the full text of the essay uh, uh, collection that we all wrote essays for. It is Creative Commons licensed. You can also buy a hard copy from MIT Press. Um, and uh, it was a real joy working on this uh, collection with all of you and uh, many, many other people he who aren't represented as well. So um, I encourage you to check it out. And um, yeah, as Andrew said, this is the Wikipedia Weekly channel. Uh, Andrew and friends do video podcasts uh, on a regular basis. So stay tuned for that as well. OK, and thanks, thanks Joseph and, uh, and Jackie for ushering that book through. It's not always easy for publishers to agree to a CC license. So good work on that. So yep. thank you, everyone.
All right. Take Thank care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.